Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always go to our website and watch the recordings at your leisure. And I'm going to show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those archive recordings on our website. Both our live show and our recorded um, archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think who might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you not uh, from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that is for all types of libraries in the state. So you will find uh, things on our show, upcoming shows and archives, for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, museums, corrections, um, special libraries. If it's got anything to do with a library, we will probably have something on the show about it. Um, so you should be able to find something for everyone. We do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, um, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, uh, cool things we think libraries could be doing or that they are doing. Uh, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on the show and just talk about things we're specifically doing here in Nebraska for Nebraska libraries. Uh, but we also do bring in guest speakers as we have this morning, and we'll get to that in just a second here. Um, but I do want to mention um, right off the bat here just quickly, uh, we um, here in Nebraska for our libraries, we are collecting resources to help libraries deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. We have here, this is our main library website. So if you're in Nebraska library, we have this post here that we have pinned to the top of our page. So it'll always be there at the top above any other new blog posts that come up. Um, if you go there, we do have uh, a, a page we put together with resources for um, libraries for people, for businesses. We also have a form where we are collecting information from libraries across the state. So if you are in Nebraska library and you want to report what you are doing as far as being open or not, what services you are or aren't offering, Wi-Fi in the parking lot, online resources, <clears throat> whatever, you can use this Google form for us and submit that. And then um, we have this list that then fits, feeds out into our page to let you know about what is going on in each of our libraries across the state. On our subpage here, we have, as I said, if you're a business, a library, looking for employment, how to, what to do with my with your kids, uh, all sorts of information we're gathering here. Um, we're always updating it and adding new resources to it. This is our specific one for libraries. So if you are in Nebraska library, go to here for things that we have gathered for you. We are also working on its um, people at libraries and everyone is starting to think about uh, how a reopening may happen. Um, when we do get to that point, uh, people are planning for it just to see, you know, when, however long down the road that is. We are working on some guidance for that for uh, Nebraska libraries. Um, some other states have been doing it and we are, you know, borrowing from some of theirs. So um, look for that to be added to here sometime soon. Um, if you are not in Nebraska, check out your own state library or your state library associations and see what kind of resources they may be gathering for you. So I am going, we are going to uh, get to today's show now. I'm going to hand over presenter control now to our presenter for the morning. So Sydney, you can get, you should see a pop up to load your presentation. There we go. Looks good. And you can do it, uh, present to do it to full screen. Looks perfect there. All right. Okay. So our presenter our, for today is, um, this is something that people may have seen the articles uh, from American libraries or things just being shared all over the place by um, people about um, virtual or digital escape rooms. Um, and with us, we have uh, Sydney Kraviak, who is from Kraviak. I got it. <laughs> from Pennsylvania <laughs> Public Library. And she is the one who created the Hogwarts specific uh, virtual escape room. There are lots of them out there now. And yes. she's going to talk about how they went through that, um, what they did, uh, tips, tricks, whatever you might need to know to create your own. So go ahead, take it away, Sydney. Tell us all about okay. what you did. Thank you. So I'm going to be looking back and forth. I've got two screens. So my presentation's in front of me and my notes are to one side. So excuse me for that. But um, 
Hello, my name is Sydney Kraviak and I work at Peters Township Public Library in McMurray, PA. I've only been in the library world for a little over two years and before that um, I taught for five years in Tennessee before I moved up to Pennsylvania. So today we're going to be going over remember I'm on different screens, a variety of things. I'm going to give you a little bit of basic information about who we are, um, just so you understand in context um, how, how we got to be here, um, what the health, how the health crisis has impacted us, talking about some other virtual programs we've done, and then the Hogwarts Digital Escape Room. I'll show you quickly how to make your own, and then what other possible applications um, you can use Google Forms for for this, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So, Peters Township Public Library is located southwest of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, we are just over the county line from the very large Carnegie Library system. So we're in a different group with them. From them, we are in part of the wagon system, which is made up of 20 mostly small and rural libraries between Washington, Green, and Fayette County. We're in Washington County ourselves. And um, we have about 21,000 card holders. And then last year, we uh, physically circulated about 20, 260,000 items, and that made up a little over a third of our total system circulation. So we're one of the larger libraries within our system. Um, our youth services department is made up of four staff members. We have our head of youth services, Shannon Polly, Ms. Linda Esposito is a children's librarian, and then there are two part-time staff, Ms. Patty and myself, um, on a regular monthly basis within the library. We host about 70 programs um, from birth to age 18, and then we also do additional outreach to local schools and child care. So for us in Pennsylvania, we got the news on March 13th that uh, public libraries needed to close as soon as possible. That um, being said, our library determined that our last day open would be Saturday the 14th. I was scheduled to work that day, so I came in. Whenever we came in that morning, we assumed we were going to be open 9 to 4 like normal. It quickly changed in those first few hours and just became 9 to 12. But within those first, those last three hours that we were physically open, we helped over 600 people come in, check out over 3,000 items. So we were swamped that day um, and have been staying busy since. So since then, we've been working hard, just like everyone else, to make sure um, we have virtual programming as well as providing patrons access to ebooks, audiobooks, databases, magazines, movies, music, and so much more. We've also worked hard to make sure everyone else knows that we're working hard. And this is an infographic um, our information technology and reference librarian Ed Wolf put together to help share with stakeholders and highlight how we are still serving the public during this time. That's a great idea. I know we've had we here at the commit at the library commission do infographics about uh, based on our annual statistics or you know that we do yearly of well, here's what's happened. Um, but something like this for all libraries, I think just we're closed, but we're not closed. <laughs> yes. Yeah, our Pennsylvania Library Association has really pushed out to the directors of libraries to still make sure everyone knows we're open, we're just not physically open. And so I was showing what we have done during that time and still collecting statistics and being able to share it in this way has helped. Unfortunately for our library, we have a staff of 27, but only six are currently working right now. Um, which is unfortunate, but and I know there are a lot of other libraries in the same boat. So for those of us that are still working, we really need to show that we are working and what we are doing. Right, absolutely. So, um, as we started to shift our focus to virtual programming, we realized that, that we needed to get a little innovative in how we were going to serve our community. We of course have shared traditional story times, um, just like what we had done in the library, we've shared that online. But everything really changed when Josh Gad, aka Olaf, stole, stole the show. Once we saw Olaf was going to be reading stories every night, I just felt like ah. I couldn't compete with that. <laughs> um, so we put our heads down to really think about what other meaningful programs and what gaps there were in our communities that we could um, try to fill. So my next few slides, I'm, I'm just going to highlight, not the escape room, but a few other things that I think can be easily replicated in other libraries. So one of the libraries in our system is Chartier's Houston Community Library. Um, on the left, this is Miss Susan, and during the regular week, she hosts kindergarten readiness story time 
for uh, caregivers and their pre-K students. So she has been posting about every week skills that uh, caregivers can still be working on with those pre-K students to help get them ready for kindergarten since they're missing out on that instruction um, from coming in the library. And then this other slide is from Miss Laura. She's the Chartier's Houston Community Library Library Manager. She's been uh, showing easy to replicate recipes from home for her patrons since they can't check out a uh, cookbook right now. And when I talked to Miss Laura, she said she's really striving to make sure that they are still connecting and having that face-to-face -face time with their patrons, um, which is very important. We know Olaf is reading and that's great, but we still do wanna be able to connect with our patrons um, and have a person that they know on the screen too. So at Peters Township, one of the things that I've been, I love this more than the escape room, sorry, but um, Miss Shannon has started doing a daily calendar time. So every morning at 8 a.m. we post a video of Miss Shannon talking about what month it is, what year it is, counting the days, talking about the letters of the alphabet, what the weather's like today, there's some songs that she goes through, and then she also each day highlights um, a kindergarten readiness concept. So on this one, you can see the uh, celebrate our community helpers. So she was holding up like little community helpers and talking about what their jobs were um, to help. And that kind of helps um, set our theme for the day because then we're able to share out um, science act experiments or activities and things that build off of that theme. Um, and then a few other things that we're also working on right I think, now. I, I think I've seen that because I recognize I recognize that calendar behind her. I've seen that pop up in my Facebook, I think. Good. I'm, it's been sharing a lot. Yeah, and it's a lot of us adults that are not sure what day of the week it is. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's great because I know I've had uh, friends or teachers I used to work with saying that, you know, their kids are thriving off the routine, off of not having a routine. And I know that may be true for them, but it might not be true for other ones. Um, so this is a, a way we thought we could have an educational impact in the community um, by filling this gap since these kids were missing out on this. And we only post it Monday to Friday. We don't do a Saturday and Sunday calendar time. Um, a few other things that we are working on, it, we, last summer we hosted a required summer reading book club with the Huntington Learning Center. They've contacted us and said that they want to figure out how to do it virtually again this year. Um, so we're working with them to try to do that for our local high school students, sharing out some DIYs. I'm working on like a scary story, uh, story time. And then um, going off of the Choose Your Own Adventure series, working on creating your own adventure series. So another virtual program we've been doing has been the Hogwarts Digital Escape Room. Um, if you've just seen it recently, you might not be aware, but it's been around since March 19th. That was the first day it went live just after 1 p.m. Uh, since then, it has become quite the world traveler. Currently, it has over 375,000 responses. Wow. And it has been translated into Spanish, Italian, and as of this morning, I can add Croatian to the list because we just wrapped that one up. Um, and then we are, have several other languages in the works that I'll show you in a little bit. So why did we make a digital escape room? On the Friday that we had to close, we actually had a family super escape room scheduled for that day. It was going to be so much fun. Everybody was going to come in. The room was set up like it was an evil villain's like layer, and they were going to have a meeting about how they were going to release all the secret identities of the superheroes. And everybody had to follow the clues to find try to find the thumb drive before the villains all came back. But I didn't want to give away any of my puzzles I had made for that because I still want to reschedule whenever we are able to open and resume regular programming. Um, so I wanted to be able to offer something digitally, and I thought back to when I was teaching in Tennessee, our consulting math teacher, um, where I taught, told us about doing digital escape rooms, and my first digital escape room I ever created was an Algebra 1 review. Oh. It was uh, not nearly as exciting as here <laughs> for myself or my students, um, but so I knew the basics of how to set something up, and I thought, it really lent itself um, for this situation. So I decided to revisit some previous physical escape rooms I had done here at the library. Um, when, I, when I first got start hired, I started planning the teen only Harry Potter escape room. We had about 50 teens come in and they had to escape detention with Dolores Umbridge. 
I was at Murray here in Michigan and was a Professor McGonagall. So Professor McGonagall had left them some clues and hints to try to find their wands, which Dolores Umbridge had uh, locked away and Dementors were going to come give the kids a talking to if they didn't find their uh, wands. And then in last January, we hosted an adult only Harry Potter escape room. Um, and if you've done the digital one, you might recognize the wand movements in the bottom right hand corner. Um, that was part of that puzzle. But in the adult Harry Potter escape room, they had to um, find the flu powder, which was hidden somewhere in the Gryffindor common room. And that storyline took place during the Battle of Hogwarts, and they were trying to find the flu powder to help um, students escape and make it home. So both of these escape rooms were twists on the J.K. Rowling books, and um, but none of the puzzles really were dependent on you knowing Harry Potter knowledge. So I knew that as I did the digital escape room, I wanted to replicate that. So I never imagined it would grow as it did, and nor did I imagine I would be here about a month later uh, talking about it on a webinar with a, the Nebraska Library Commission. So now I'm going to take you behind the scenes and show you what it looks like from my end of the Hogwarts digital escape room. So up here you'll see it is 35 sections. Um, and real quick spoiler alert, if you haven't done it yet, you are going to see some answers. So sorry about that, guys. Um, we're looking at a copy of it because the actual escape room takes a long time to load because it's constantly getting more responses. So I just made a copy of it. That's why it doesn't say there are any responses up top. So the Hogwarts Digital Escape Room has 35 sections um, within the Google form. It has four distinct locations that people travel to and it has six puzzles. This is actually version 2.0 of the escape room. The first escape room um, had three places that people traveled to and four puzzles. And I'll talk about why that changed uh, in a little bit. Um, the initial escape room did take about four hours to create, and that included creating the storyline, modifying the puzzles, making the Google form, and a lot of beta testing and editing. The very first version I made, I sent it off to my little sister in Cincinnati, and she and her roommate are texting me going, there's no right answer here. And it turns out I went back and checked my math and I had like copied down the numbers wrong and there were not the correct number of sickles anywhere on the page. So oops, that's why you test things out. That's why you always double check, right? Yeah, it's important to have uh, big testing and, and uh, usability testing like that. Yes. So this is the most recent version. Um, as you scroll down, you can see that some things are made up of pictures, some things are made up of questions. Um, each section is a different page that you travel to. So some sections are questions, some sections are if you got it wrong, some are if you got it right, some are just information to help share. Um, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit further to the end. And... After you escape the escape room, I had put in some just demographic information to help us. Um, for our state reporting, we break it down into young child, juvenile, teen, or adult. So that's helped us um, have statistics to help report back to our state and other stakeholders. Okay, I'm gonna switch back to my slides to show you. I know, um, Right here, it doesn't say I have any responses because no one's done it because it's just a copy. But on the actual escape room, I took it offline the other day so I could take some screenshots. So whenever I do scroll down, I'm able to see that about a third of the people who have completed it have completed it as a group and two thirds by themselves. And then I can see that number break down from the responses. I can see a majority of the people, about 50% that have done it have been the 19 to 39 year range. And we've had 2044, uh, 70 or older completed as well, which I thought was really neat. So another thing that um, the Google form does for you, it also takes all of your information and drops it into an Excel sheet. But I also made a screenshot of this just because it takes a very long time to load. Um, so on this one, you're able to see the timestamp of when it was completed, what their answers were, and then their answers to demographic information at the end. You'll note that 
everyone here has the exact same answer because it only records the last answer that they put in. So, so if someone got the first puzzle wrong three times, I have no way of knowing that because it only says, oh, well, they got 1700 and that was the right answer at the very end. So just be aware that that is one limitation with the data of the Google Forms, especially if you're using it in an education setting with classroom. Cindy, can you make that present mode again to make it full screen? Yes. And you can yeah, see it a little bit clearer, maybe. Well, yeah, because yeah, it zooms it in a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we can see, and what's really neat is what state or province, and if you look over here, we've got Spain, New Jersey, Canada, Arkansas, Virginia, Ontario, Wales, um, and this is just from the English version. Um, the Spanish, Italian, and Croatian versions all have their own Excel sheets that they are taking their data to. Okay. So um, feedback and translation. So feedback we've gotten from the community and around the world has been absolutely phenomenal. We've had a lot of librarians and teachers reach out um, to say that they want to share it with their patrons or with their classes. Um, and then we've had families to say that they're looking for more fun activities. Um, some of the my, one of my favorite ones was the family who had to cancel their daughter's birthday party and then they found this so they were saving it they didn't tell their daughter about it but they were going to do like a zoom birthday party for their daughter and they were all going to do the escape room together so it's like those those warm and fuzzy things are absolutely <laughs> wonderful to hear um, and i know i had a friend of mine here in lincoln told me that she went through it with her kids and is now going to potentially use it for something that she's doing for her work as a um, nurse instructor yes um i got an email, I can't remember where from, but it was a nurse educator who said that as they move to um, virtual and online, creating something like this would be great to use with their nursing students. Mm -hmm. um, and I also had a police educator from South Dakota say that creating scenarios like this where it had it was kind of open and they would have to make a decision and see what the impact of what that decision was um, for police training would be a good tool. So a lot of really neat applications from professionals outside of the traditional education world um, who were thinking about how they can apply this to, to uh, what they do. Mm -hmm. So for translations, I've worked on moving everything to a Google site. So now if we scroll down, we can see the four languages we have so far. Um, English, Spanish, Italian, and Croatian, which Croatian just got finished this morning. Um, other ones we're working on, we have a French Canadian, Basque, and Catalan are also in the works. So hoping to wrap those up in the next week or two. Um, so, and just so um, for the Spanish one, I put everything into Google Translate and I made a contact with a librarian from Madrid who he himself was not fluent in English, but he was able to go through the Google Translate and give me feedback to make it less rigid and to flow more because Google Translate is a great tool, but it is not the end all be all. Um, so the Italian one was a teacher and the Croatian one was a librarian there as well. So just to show you, um, the puzzle for the international versions are exactly alike, except for the very last one. Um, I do not expect anyone across the world to have a, an in-depth knowledge of U.S. geography. <laughs> so what I did was I changed that one to a world map, just using the largest countries that I could find. So here we can see there's an arrow on Canada, an arrow on India. So it's very similar to the U.S. one. It's just Celsius and uh, countries instead sure sure so we have a comment a from someone says yay french canadian our customers will love that <laughs> Good. i'm so glad um next i want to take a moment to talk about some of the the fun challenges that have come up over the last month um mm -hmm. so as i mentioned before version this was a this is the second version version 2.0 of the escape room version one actually if you had done it in the first week it was it existed um, for the first puzzle, there was a movie or a trailer for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone that you had to watch. And then after the trailer ended, it asked you how many times was Harry said and how many times was Potter said. Harry plus Potter um, was that question initially. So I thought that since I had just, it was embedded from YouTube, I'm not taking credit for it. I'm not making any money. Everything's fine, right? 
everything was not fine. Um, one of our staff members attempted to get the uh, attention of J.K. Rowling to, you know, get her to maybe share it out and say, hey, look at this. Um, and instead, we got a phone call from Warner Brothers stating that for the time being, it was fine. But once the current health crisis came to an end, they would like it to be taken down and removed. Um, and Warner Brothers issue was with any pictures, um, stills or video from the movie, which was the Harry Potter trailer. So I decided I wanted this to have a little bit more longevity than just the health crisis. So I decided to um, take that puzzle down. So for the escape rooms one week anniversary, it got a makeover. The video was taken down. We changed it to the Dewey Decimal puzzle. And then the Alcatraz puzzle was added on at the very end because Alcatraz was not there initially. Okay. It actually answered the question that we did have from somebody um, just a little while ago about how did you get permissions to use the Harry Potter terminology and about that. And now you talked about they only seem to have concerns with the actual images, not using well, yeah, Warner Brothers only owns the movies, um, and from what we looked into, into fair use, as well as like kind of fan fiction type things, um, mm -hmm. and the fact that we're not, you know, financially benefiting from anything, and again, mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer, I am not a copyright excerpt, expert at all, but mm -hmm. I know the other images and things that um, have been used are fair use. Um, if J.K. Rowling were to reach out and say, hey, I did not give you permission to use Green Gods, that's something where I could come back and say, wizarding school, wizarding money, and maybe make up something else um, if I wanted this to continue. So, but so far, that hasn't come up. From the movie, from one. Yeah. So we're hoping, and I know that they just released the w wizarding world um, as well. So. Hopefully they don't feel like I'm taking away <laughs> any any of their publicity. Um, one other challenge I want to point out is these two pictures that you see here next. Um, a teacher in Canada actually contacted me just last week with concerns about this middle image. Whenever you arrive to Alcatraz in the escape room and it said, hey, you're on Alcatraz, it showed this image. And the teacher pointed out that um, the words Indians welcome in the red paint, which is actually from the occupation of Alcatraz from 1969 to 1971, that a lot of her First Nation families would find that to be culturally insensitive. And she had already known several teachers who had shared out the escape room and they had received backlash um, from families about it, um, which the more I thought about it, I do not give any context for this. I do not um, explain the occupation of Alcatraz or the Native American movement at the time in the United States. And so this background is not necessary, um, nor is it helpful to the escape room. So after I received her email, I changed it to the picture on the right for all of the um, versions of the escape room to help mitigate that. So that was something I was not aware of and something that I did not think about. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Alcatraz last year and that's why we went there in our escape room. Um, and so that was something that I had seen and felt it was okay. And now I know that it was not. And I appreciate her for taking time to point that out to me. Yeah, and we do have a thank you about that in our comments as well. Thank you for changing that. That would have been, yes, offensive to Indigenous peoples in Canada, especially since you're going to have the French-Canadian version. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so another thing that some teachers have reached out as well is privacy concerns, because at the very end of the escape room, it does ask you, are you playing this alone or with a group and your age information and where you're from? Um, and those are required questions, so that way we can connect for our data. Um, and they said, Our, I can't share this out if those questions are asked. Um, so instead I've shared out, I made a, about like a 15 minute YouTube tutorial about how to make your own. So for those teachers I sent back, I'm sorry, um, that's unfortunate, but I totally understand that your school district won't allow that. In the meantime, here's a video on how you can make your own. So feel free to adapt and do your own thing. So speaking of, making your own we are going to switch over and i'm going to show you the basics of how you can set up your own escape room okay so um, one question i want to ask is i just put, put it here before you get into that someone has a question about the escape room itself um and i suppose this might vary how about how long does it take for one to complete the escape room um, the version that's up right now usually like 15 to 20 minutes depending on the math level um there's 
if you have not done it yet and you plan on sharing it out for others to do, um, especially teachers, I highly recommend you do it yourself because I've had some teachers like, oh, my second graders would love this. And I'm like, well, the Dewey Decimal question does take a lot of inferring. Um, and then some of the math, I don't know your second graders math level. So as a teacher, make sure you do it first before you share it out. Um, and it is something that is um, that your students would be successful with. But I would say 15 minutes. And my, my a friend here says that it took that her and her two kids about 20 minutes to do it. Okay, yeah. It might depend if you have multiple kids, like you get some you know, families at home doing it. If you have multiple kids of different levels working on it together, that would make, you know, affect the older one can figure out things quicker sometimes. Yeah, that would, that makes sense. Um, or, you know, any group doing it, which I've had a lot of people reach out and say like they've completed it like over Zoom or other conferencing software mm -hmm. that way. So if you just have one person kind of, narrating and guiding everyone through and you're getting feedback um a situation like that would probably take a little bit longer than the 15 by yourself sure the discussion okay. are about what the right answer is. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so to create your own all you need is a google account um if you're an educator and you are using google classrooms um it's super easy oh i keep saying google now my phone i think i'm talking to thinks i'm talking to it <laughs> So um, whenever you are at google.com and you go to your Google apps from here, um, docs and other things pop up. Forms does not. So I usually like to go to my Google Drive to start with and then go to new. Again, you look, you do not see a Google form, which is the purple. So we click the bottom to more to get to Google Forms. Um, and then there's an arrow to the right. A lot of people have reached out asking, uh, which template did you use? There is not an escape room template. If you look at it, um, there are templates for like a birthday party invitation or getting feedback about like when everybody is okay to meet. And there's a lot of useful things there. Like there's even um, like just to make a quiz for a classroom or an exit. So for our Google um, Forms escape room, we are just gonna create a new blank form. So let's take a second to label it in Compass Live Escape Room. Oops. Please excuse any and all spelling errors that will inevitably happen during this. So just a few things to navigate, just like how you saw my version earlier. We have a question side and we have a response side. Of course, there are zero responses. This just came into an existence and it has not been shared. Um, up at the top, let's look at some of our settings. The palette allows you to customize your theme. If you add an image to it, this is where I uploaded and added that um, the Hogwarts train with um, our library's logo in the back. So if you wanted to change or add an image that um, Google already has preloaded, once you add an image, your theme color is going to automatically change to match whatever your image is. Even if it's something you upload yourself. Google's smart like that. And then you can also change your um, font style here. The next thing we see is the preview button. This allows you to see it as if you were a user. As of right now, our escape room does not look that impressive. So let's go back and add some more stuff. And settings. So this part is super duper important because it's what helps you um, tell people where to go. As of right now, the Google form is just like a survey. People tell you their answers. It doesn't do anything else. So what we're going to do is actually turn it into a Google quiz. Google quiz allows you to have right answers and wrong answers. And just to show you some of these other settings, you can make it so what, that um, it has to collect email addresses. People cannot submit or be part of it unless they do, uh, do an email address because I wanted this to be done by everyone. I didn't want um, an email address to scare anyone away, so I did not require it for mine. And you'll see you can also limit to one response. Um, this makes them sign in like with a Google account. Um, to show that that person's only responded once. And then other options are they can edit their submissions or see how they did afterwards, which again, if you're using it for educational purposes, um, could be the tools. Presentation, this shows you as it goes through. So progress bar is at the bottom of the screen. It tells you, you know, you're on page two, you're 20% done. I didn't want people to know how close they were to the end or the beginning, so I did not do that. Couple question order. If you are doing an actual quiz um, and you don't want anybody to see what anybody else is doing, shuffle question is a good one for that. But since it is an escape room and everyone's going to be forced to go in the same order, there's no need to shuffle it. 
and this show link to submit another response after they push submit it would say hey would you like to submit another response and they could click there um, and then you can also add a confirmation message so after they've clicked submit you say thanks for checking our escape room or maybe a link to a website or other additional activities um, as I said before, we do want to toggle this to make it a quiz. It'll tell you whenever their grade is released, either immediately or later. If you do later, that means you, as the creator of this quiz, you're going in to score something. Because in escape room, you don't want anybody to have to wait for you to get back to them. We definitely want it to be immediate. Um, and then respondents can see if they missed questions, what their correct answers were, what their point values were. Again, if you're using this for educational purposes, those are good tools because it's an escape room and it forces everybody down the correct path. There's not much for them to see. So after we've made it a quiz and changed a few settings, we want to make sure we push save. Ooh, excuse me. Oh, for some reason I did email address. I'm going to click that off. I don't want to collect email addresses. So. Now we have our first question. So in the Hogwarts Digital Escape Room, I only used multiple choice. If you click here, you can see there are several different options. Um, there are some you cannot use for an escape room um, like I made. If you do a paragraph, it requires someone to come in and score that paragraph. Yeah. If you do um, a multiple choice grid or a text box grid, it's taking in multiple points of data. And so it can't steer people different directions. You need one point of data at a time for the escape room to determine, okay, which way do they go from this one point of data? So that's why um, the multiple choice or even short answer is fine, as long as maybe you say lowercase letters only or whatever specific format you want. Because if you start with the first letters capital and the rest are lowercase, it might throw some people off and they might have to say, oh, well, I could have sworn it was the word pumpkin. I keep typing in pumpkin, but it won't accept it because it's all caps or all lowercase or something like that. So that's something to be aware of if you do do it that way. Um, for right now, I'm gonna show you how to set up for multiple choice. So our first question, which door should you walk through? And we're gonna add our four options, door one, Door two, door three, door two, door four. So if we look through here, we can see our question is required. Um, if it's a quiz, they will usually automatically become required, but that's a good thing to always double check or else somebody might accidentally skip past a question. And to send it to different sections, there are these three stack dots to the right where it says required. If you click that, there's a place for description, shuffle option order, go to section based on answer. Once you click that, it now tells you next to each option where they're going to go. So right now, if we click it, we see our only section is section one. So let's come over to our settings on the right. The very bottom one is add a section where it's like a pause, it's the page break that you're adding in. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in two sections. We now see you have section two and section three down here. And I'm gonna make section two a wrong answer and section three my right answer. If you're just getting started and setting it up, this is a good thing to do to help keep yourself in track instead of it just being section one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, blah, blah. Um, that way you know which one's right, which one's wrong. So let's make the right answer be door number two. So I have door number two is going to the section that's called right answer and door number three is going to the section called wrong answer. So down at the bottom of our first section, it tells us, do we want to continue? It doesn't matter what it says right here because it's going to continue based on what their answer is. For our wrong answer, open the door and a dinosaur is running towards you. You slam the door shut and check your clues again. Now they're wrong, so I want them to go back to the question to try it again. So after this section, we want them to go back to section one, which had the question. 
So real quick, let's take a second to just preview what we've done so far. So on the first page, we have our question. I know if I do door number one, it's wrong. You open the door and a dinosaur is running towards you. If I click next, it takes me back to the question. If I click door two, right answer, it asks me to submit because that's what, as far we've gotten so far. So let's go in and add some flourish to this. So a dinosaur is running towards you. Nothing's fun without pictures. So you have options on this side to add pictures, add videos, to add another title or description, to import questions, um, or to add another question, which we'll add another question in a minute. So right now, let's add a picture. You can upload, um, you can do a lot of different things. For most of mine, I use the Google image search because Google is only going to search for things that are copyright free and fair use for you to use um, within this Google document. Now, if you just open up Google and search for a dinosaur, it might bring up things from Jurassic Park, which are, which are copyrighted, but this is not. So we got a dinosaur running towards us. Yeah, there's a dinosaur. He looks nice. So now we have that there. And if we go back to view, our wrong answer, there's our dinosaur. Okay, now, another thing I wanna show you that alters it is, as we saw on the um, Hogwarts escape room, there was a page of just information first before you got started into it. So if I come back to my title and I want to add a section break here, I've now moved my question down to section number two. So if you do this, this is where you want to double check and make sure that your questions are still going to the right and wrong areas that you want them to, as well as after each section. So right now, after the dinosaur tells us to go back to section one. Well, now we can just go back to section two because that's where the question is. We don't need all of this introduction. Okay, so right answer. Good job. <laughs> Here is another question. So let's add another question and practice that again. So if we add another question, we have the option of multiple choice or short answer. Just to show you, if you do decide to do a short answer, um, what year is it? That's an So it asks, um, is it a number? Is that number and custom error text for um, if it's wrong. So this is where you have to put answer key if you are doing um, a short answer response like this. So if we want what year is it, that's the only answer. You do have the option to add other correct answers. So if somebody was gonna type it out and I wanted them, if they typed out the word 2020 to work out, or I could type in 2020. So, and then if it's not these, all the other answers are incorrect. Okay, so again, we want to, oops. Yeah. Don't want that, just a number. It's that number. Okay, so if it's not it, um, this is where we can say, hmm, that's, not right, try again and send them someplace else. So let me come back over here to my notes real quick. Um, after you get everything in there and you have things the way you want them, you can go back and preview it. I highly recommend sending it to tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of people before you share it out. Um, up to the right of the send button, there are a few other things and settings I wanna show you. You have the option to make a copy, you can trash it, get a pre-filled in link where it has you go through and say, this is what the correct answers are and it sends it to whomever you want. Um, you send the link to them and it shows 
whatever it is that you filled in. And then you have the option to add collaborators if you are working on something as a group. And then whenever you choose to send it and you are ready, this is where you can send to specific email addresses. You can copy the link and shorten the link, or you can embed it as well. Um, there are a few other uh, uses that I know um, we've talked about within our, yes. Going back to, yeah, some just have um, a question about it, and I think I know the answer, but um, are we able to create a different response and picture for each wrong answer? I assume for each yes, question. Yes, you could. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted to add in another wrong answer section, um, and then come back to this. So we have, no one's going to section three right now, so I can say door number one goes to section three instead and make that something else. So each uh, output can go to a different area that you wanted, which brings me to another um, application we said that we could use this for, is like a choose your own adventure kind of thing, where you know, you've got your starting point, which you choose, and how it can lead to all those different outlying events underneath that. So creating your own adventure that way. Um, and then also in the past at the library, this past February, we did a murder mystery event. And we've been trying to think of other like virtual adult programming um, that's not just sitting and listening to someone talk. Um, so uh, we think, I think I'm gonna pull a lot of like the, the back behind the scenes text I had made for like our actors um, who are, um, suspects and like put that plus some more um, clues and things like that and create like a murder mystery using Google Forms as well is is my next big plan. <laughs> that actually kind of <laughs> someone asked if there's been any other themes besides Harry Potter. Um, I have not right now. I know that there are a lot of escape like virtual escape rooms floating around right now um, that are not Harry Potter themed. So even if you just search like virtual escape rooms, you're gonna find a lot. Um, I personally have not. Um, this escape room has consumed a lot of my time over the last month, a lot more than I thought it would initially. Um, but I do hope to do something with our murder mystery. It was, that night was so much fun. And I think it would be great for our patrons to relive that and to give an opportunity for patrons who didn't come to that to experience the first time as well like we have videos of people fighting like behind the scenes footage and other things to upload an, an autopsy report video that one of our staff members did it was a good time so that's probably going to be my next big thing i think you just look at what is popular if someone has actually commented that they're looking at doing a doctor who thing one and percy yeah. jackson mm -hmm. um and and there's been a lot of like fairy tale ones which i know ties into like the summer reading theme this year as well. And so I had looked at um, doing like a Twisted Tale um, one too. Yeah. And just to show you, as you do start to create your own, and these slides will be shared um, as well whenever the recording goes up, but I have the link for the Google Form support. They walk you through how to set up a lot of things and um, answer common questions. The program that I used for creating um, my clues was Canva. Um, we, yeah, for our promotional material here, I love Canva. And then um, our um, PR coordinator, Carrie Weaver, told me about Unsplash, which is free photos um, that you can go on and search for different things. So that's where the like train photo and the Hogwarts castle photo both came from Unsplash. They're people's personal photos that they put up and just request that, you know, you give them a shout out if you use it. So, yeah. Awesome. That's it. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's great. Those resources there on um, Unsplash. Yeah, we definitely use that. That's a great resource because it is the photographers themselves putting up the photos and you will um, see information about them. It's not just, don't just Google and do a random search on the internet to find things. Go to somewhere specific that does that mm -hmm. for, <clears throat> for a reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're great. They're high quality photos. And we've been able to, you know, find all sorts of random things that you wouldn't think 
on there too. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so we do have some questions. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and start typing them in. People have been doing it throughout as well. Um, and as, as Sydney mentioned, when we do post the archive of the recording, the slides will be available as well. She's going to send me the link to her Google Slides there, so we'll include that so you can have access to that too. Um, all right, so I also want to know, um, and I don't know if you've mentioned this or not yet, are we able to use your Harry Potter escape room at our own libraries, if we would credit you, of course, um, so I guess, if so would you prefer we make a copy or use your original form? Like basically, can they just send people to what you've got up there or should they make their own of it? Yeah, um, if we're asking that um, if you do share it out, you're more than welcome to share it. And we're trying to get the new Google site um, website circulated since that what that's what's going to house translations. Like I sent it to some um, librarians in California since it does have the Spanish translation, so they were able to share it with uh, some of their patrons who might not have had access to it afterwards. So y'all are more than welcome to share it around, um, use it in whatever nonprofit way you like. Um, if you do share it on Facebook, make sure you tag us, Peter Township Public Library. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. I have some questions about doing it. That's oh, someone says thanks, Sydney. Really informative and helpful. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, glad to have this out there. Yeah. Um, I know there was the article uh, that the, where I originally saw that you had done this in um, American Libraries magazine and online as well. Uh, and there was um, some information in there about it. But I was really glad to be able to have you come on here and do a little longer explanation with some more uh, interaction with some of our uh, attendees. So mm -hmm. hopefully this gets up there will help even more people do these kind of things. Um, so we got a bunch of questions coming in here. I'm just going to start at the top here and see what we have. Um, okay, I saw an escape room where they had a picture with links to different images that opened up in different tabs. Is that something you've know you, you've done or would know how to do? So are you if I understand you wrong, so that's where they might, they would like just put a link here. So link to picture. Um, if just like how in my Hogwarts escape room, there's a link to information about like how many galleons, sickles and nuts in those uh, transfer rates are. And whenever you click that, it opens up into a new tab. So whatever link you put in should take you to a new tab on there. I think it's the way that the Google form automatically does it. Ah, so that's an easy one. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, we do have a, a multiple questions about how did you create the clues, uh, decide what puzzles? Um, is, can you talk more about your puzzle design process? What makes a good puzzle? Yeah. Um, this is actually something I was talking to my husband about last night when I was running him through it. Um, whenever I've done our physical escape rooms, I usually start with the the end game. So for the last Harry Potter one we did, we had flu powder and I actually thought about bringing up like my giant lockbox up here, but I did not. Um, and it, where it was locked in and what um, locks I wanted on that and then working within the parameters of those locks. If it was a alpha or numeric lock, um, what kind of things puzzle I would need to create around that. For the digital one, it was great to not have to work with the confines of our physical space. I know a lot of actual escape rooms, you go from room to room um, as part of like their big thing. We don't have a space in our library where we were able to accommodate something like that. So as far as the physical one um, or the digital one, I had decided that um, I wanted to use some things I had used before. So sorry, I'm like scrolling forever. The wand movement one, this was um, a page we had used in a previous escape room. So I had a similar puzzle to this for an escape room I had done. So that's why I chose to do that one. And then, um, and it was the same thing where they had um, certain spells that were circled that they had to use to actually open um, a directional lock. As far as creating some of the other ones, I wanted to still incorporate some Harry Potter stuff, but I didn't want it to be specific to the movies or to the books to where you had to have this information. So it was that generic um, things that aren't like no spoilers. A lot of people have reached out to say, well, we're only on book four. Are there any spoilers in it? And there are not. So uh, picking some some information 
um, that J.K. Rowling created, like like Gringotts and the money, um, and being able to work that as well. So whenever I created my story, I thought it would be super neat um, if it was Harry Potter themed because everybody loves Harry Potter. And but I thought in my head it would be so fun if it's a bunch of wizards, but like they're trying to open a cell phone and they've never opened it. Like if you handed uh, Ron Weasley an iPhone, what's he going to do with it? Kind of like played out in my head as I'm thinking through this. So that's how I came up with the whole, wouldn't it be funny if uh, situation? And from there, it, it just kind of grew. But for it, um, I like to think of it as a flow chart. You have, you know, your starting point and then what are your options here? For the digital escape room, since it does force everyone into kind of a single direction, um, you don't have to worry about as many outliers or things coming back into play. It's a lot more linear than an actual escape room would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel like, I don't know if I answered it, your question, but I hope it helps. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I think it's a good note, like if you've done traditional escape rooms, many of those things you've already created can just be trans moved into this. Some of mm -hmm. them will play really well as digital versions, some not so much, but um, yes. then you come up with other uh, versions as well. Um, for that um, Harry Potter, I pulled up, this was a, a editable daily profit I found somewhere online where you could go in and put in your own stuff. So my inspiration for the last puzzle about the weather and the map came from uh, the last escape room that we had done on the last page of the Daily Prophet. It listed today's weather in certain areas. And then in our physical escape room, there was a map of Great Britain. When you shine the black light over it, certain cities were circled. And so that gave them the numbers they needed to open a combination lock. So I, I was able to adapt that as well to um, something for the digital escape room. All right. Yeah. So definitely some great ideas. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Since we're talking about creating it, someone wants to know if you have any uh, suggestion or advice about how many questions or rooms should it have? I suppose that's going to depend on what you're going for. Yeah. Um, because I wanted mine to be for all ages. I did not want to create anything too long. Um, after oh, you mentioned it, earlier, this one has taken people generally 15 to 20 minutes to yeah. complete. And and how many are in the one this one? How many questions do you have that made people have taken? Oh, I have um there's six puzzles altogether. The Dewey Decimal, um, two for the scales and the Gringotts money. There is the one wand movement puzzle and then the two questions about the um, weather at the end. So there's six questions altogether and there's four locations that they travel to. Okay. So that gives you an idea of how many questions can feed into how long it would be. Yeah. And again, to create all this, like the, the page takes you 10 years to scroll down because it does have 35 different sections. And that's where the more you create it, if you think like, oh, it's only 15 minutes, it's not that long. But, you know, four hours for the first shorter version, plus it took probably another four hours to make a copy of this and edit it to the version it is now and then integrate that back in. That way it was still all on the same link. So, um it's great. It's wonderful. And it is time intensive. It's something to think about. Yeah. Exactly. Somebody says, I think that it only took you four hours. <laughs> only four hours when the baby was napping. <laughs> it's going to depend on what you need to find when you're looking for the, the puzzles. Um, someone wants to know, what is what do you suggest as a first try at creating a digit? Uh, what type of puzzles for a first try? Um, um, the... The less that you would have to make on your own um, is probably the better. You don't want to have to like recreate things. Like doing doing math puzzles like that is something that was easy. Um, the Dewey Decimal one did take a little bit more time because I had to create the fake text message and. Um, for the translations, I've had to translate the Dewey Decimal poster into other languages as well um, but it I think math is a great way to go I love math I used to teach math math is the best um, 
And I did not want to make anything like that was based on reading comprehension. Um, I've seen some where people had like posted a picture and it was like, okay, how many red flowers or how many yellow daisies or things like that are in the picture and that ties into what the solution is. I think if it's your first time, definitely stick with those multiple choice um, questions. And that's where you can only have three options or four options or 10 options if you wanted to. Um, and that's why you see to make things more difficult for the last puzzle, I did add several more options to try to throw people off instead of just having, you know, four. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see here. Um... Oh, okay, so someone has a question. Well, if they're participating as a group, is there an option to participate under a group name? I guess rather um, than individual. So for mine, I did not collect like your name or any information like that. I know uh, people have reached out and said that they've used Zoom to complete it as a group where one person screen shares out. Um, mm -hmm. The only part that I ask, like if it's a group is like in the very end, my demographic information, um, are you doing this alone or as a group? Mm -hmm. um, so it isn't really a, where you're logging in with the name of anything to no. start with. You just go there mm -hmm. and then you however you want yeah. with you on your own, you and a bunch of, you know, like the, the one woman I know, her and her children sitting together or Zooming people in just screen sharing. Yeah, there's not really a place where you do that. You just go in there and start answering the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not sure how other people have structured theirs, but I, I tried to structure mine so that way there were um, less less barriers that way. So that way you did not, I know a lot of times when we ask people for email addresses, they're like, no, nope, ah, you're not getting that info from me. Or even where I ask like, where are you from? And people say, no, none of your business or things like that in their comments um, that they leave me, which is fine. I understand asking people for their email address would be something that would turn several people away. And that's why I also asked my like demographic questions at the very end. Mm -hmm. And now someone has a question about statistics, which is interesting because yes. these this is something that's just out there publicly for anyone to use. So, will you, well, the question is, will you be able to use the responses for your library statistics? Since I mean, do you have something I guess in your statistics that I mean, this is something I guess everybody's going to have to be dealing with now? This is something out there that anyone in the world could go and do. How does that get then reported to uh, your own library statistics? So um, we've received some guidance from our state in Pennsylvania about um, recording virtual programs in this way. So even if you are uploading a video on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. how we we understand it's going to go beyond our immediate community. And for the time being, the directives we've received is to every view counts and um, there's even been some talk that maybe a view counts us twice because it's probably a caregiver and a child watching it together, probably, yeah. um, which is a good point there. So we have been using it for our statistics um, and just like how whenever we do um, a Facebook of something, we are able to like we did a Facebook live Harry Potter trivia and so or like a photo challenge and a few other things. So we've been using those statistics from Facebook as well with the engagements and the comments and the shares um, to report back for our statistics. Um, as far as like our physical circulation goes, our renewing and stuff like that um, is going towards our statistics, but that right now is limited. So we've been told to kind of get numbers honestly where we can. Sure, absolutely. Now, we're, we're, our statistics are going to be whatever's happening right now, which may be different mm -hmm. than happening a year ago at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So then the talked, question they just put in, if we share your puzzle, the user count goes to your library, of course. If you, as a library, want to have some, the fact, you know, somehow count that this is going to yours, your library's, your own library's user account, you need to make a copy of this and post your own link to yours that you would be tracking then in your library's own Google account. Yeah, I think one way that um, you could, if it was something that you shared on your library's Facebook, that's where you could track on that Facebook post, the engagements and clicks from it and stuff like that as well. I know I have had several requests for people asking for a copy of the escape room and we decided to decline those for the time being. Um, and I would be happy to share like the little fake template that we made today um, whenever I send you the slides as well. So people have access to that. Um, 
but again it's something that someone could create their own or if it is something that they shared on facebook they can use that post to um come back and look at the engagements to get for their statistics yeah it's going to depend on how you're tracking your statistics yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to mention to people, I know some people have been um, logging out of the meeting of our webinar right now. Our, our show does officially go 10 to 11 a.m., but we do go as long as it takes to get through all the presentation or the questions coming in. We won't get cut off by our GoToWebinar system or anything. So feel free to stick around as long as we have questions to answer here. We'll go until they're all done. Um, if you do need to leave, that's fine. Uh, we are recording, and then you will have access to the recording afterwards with all of this information and all these questions. And, of course, you can always reach out to Sydney at her library, too. Um, one other thing off of the statistics, I'm going to open up the Spanish version as well, because that one of our international one has had the most hits. Um, so the librarian that helped uh, translate this, they are a co-collaborator on this form, so that way he has access to come in and see the statistics for, for him to use since he helped create this version of it. And the same with the Italian and the Croatian one as well, um, because so the people that you have helping with translating, you're actually helping kind of create them sometimes with those translations, give mm -hmm. them access to benefit from it as well. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Um, ooh, how did you find your translators? How did you build that relationship? These are all people who reached out to me. Um, I... I've traveled a little bit around the world, but um, most of the the friends I've made, like I used to work for the Girl Scouts and we had a lot of international staff come and work for summers, but a lot of them are from English speaking countries as well. So all of the translations have been people who've reached out to me and said, hi, this is great. Would you be interested or do you think there's any way? And that's when I present them with, if you would like to do a direct translation, I have this international version with a world map. I would love to collaborate with you on that. Um, here's how we can get that done. Or if you would rather make something your own, um, you're more than welcome to as well. And here's a video to help show you how to create your own. Because I don't want to like force anyone to feel like, oh crap, now I have to do this work with her. Um, but some people are happy with the direct translation. Other people are like, yeah, I think I'd want to change a few things to make it like specific to my library or to whatever group I'm working with. And that's perfectly fine. So that's awesome. Yeah, the people are reaching out to you for that. Yeah. And I'm assuming this maybe will happen with other people because I know people are, because uh, I've seen that this it's become a huge thing now. Lots of people posting about their escape rooms they've done on all these different topics and they may be getting the same responses too of, oh, that's a great topic. Our people would like it. Let's mm -hmm. figure out how we get that into our country. <laughs> Um, so I want to know about the link to the Google site that is in all the different languages. Um, we'll post that as well in our, yes. um, yeah, definitely. So, um, and that's the one right there, but, um, yeah, we'll add a link to that. Um, is that in the slides too, or no? It is not in the slides, but I can add it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you will have access to that afterwards too, because we want to see the different ones that are out there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's something we've shared on our Facebook, um, so it's out there and about, but yeah, we'll make sure you yeah, guys it's get out and about, and it's the new one that we're trying to get out more that way. Um, and actually, I, I, what I need to do is go back on the English one and have a line at the top that said, would you like to play this in another language? And then a link there. Mm -hmm. That way people... I'm going to put that on my list of things to do. <laughs> and we have a couple of questions. I'm going to do the last couple of questions here. Um, I think you'd already, you showed earlier about how to add the clue images in the Google, right? How to add them. Yeah, and, and yeah. I can show that. I have so many tabs now. Okay, back here. <laughs> so if we wanted to add a clue here about what door or something like that, this is where if you have something you've created in Canva or another program, you can upload that image. Um, if you just want to find images of four doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And someone just have said, since we're talking about images, it's a good time to mention. Someone did mention some other places that are good resources for um, pictures without breaking copyright. Yes. Uh, Wikimedia Commons. Um, Pixabay, I know a lot of people use Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y, and um, Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S. It's not one that I've, but they also offer free photos to use without breaking copyright. Okay, There's I lots can add those to that last slide as well. Yeah. Um, 
And someone did that when you were talking about actually it was actually the, the one with being able to click on something. The person who was asking about that about being able to click on an image and going to a new tab said the one that they saw was a, a single picture with multiple areas you would click on, and I guess each area would go somewhere else. Is that a Google thing, or that might be something they might have done in? That college? might be something else. If it is, Paul, I am. No no google expert i know how to do this <laughs> um that is not something that i've come across um so i would think that's something outside of google yeah, it's not Wait, so was it at an aquarium because it was at oh, an aquarium it was definitely well, not great. One, oh. i um someone mm, i think her name was rachel zolini maybe um they were making one for uh, it looked like an aquarium that they worked at and it was kind of like how you can like Google tour a place and go in and like put the area arrows. It looked like that um, for the one I saw, which is definitely not within the Google form. Yeah, so they may have done their own thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that answer, if you really want a real answer, you should reach out to whoever did that one that you saw. <laughs> and then let me know. <laughs> yeah, and here's a good question too. When you edit the original, like you know, you said you've made changes to it over time and updating things mm -hmm. and modify things, does that affect your statistics or it still just keeps adding on to the same statistics from the previous versions. It keeps adding on. So unfortunately, um, at about 120,000 responses, my Google sheet that all my data was in died. I don't know why, because my, the new one has 200, some 250,000 responses and it's doing fine. Um, but at some point, it stopped doing fine and I had to um, delete all of my previous responses. So I like keep a running tab in a different document so that way I know how many it's really up to. Um, let's come back here. Be aware of the random technical hiccups that might happen. <laughs> yeah. So for instance, like if I this is the actual, actual Hogwarts um, digital escape room right now. And whether or not it will load something went wrong reload it does that a lot so when it comes time and I do want to change something um, once you go over to responses I usually click off and say sorry so if anyone's on the escape room right now they would get kicked off um, because it's no longer accepting responses and then I'm able to go in and edit things so whenever I made the big change for a week I said it'll be back up by this certain time Eastern pause while we're making additions and yeah and that's where you can add a note in there saying hey I'm doing this um and it'll be right back and right now it's trying to think about your website thing down for maintenance for a limited amount of time yeah yeah um and now it won't let me turn it back on <laughs> um, um but in the original one, it asked slightly different questions. And so whenever the new questions rolled out and it was no longer asking, you know, how many times was Harry and Potter said, it created new columns in Google Sheets automatically to pull that information. Um, mm -hmm. Because my statistics information stayed the same and like just the number of responses isn't going to um, alter how that's recorded, that was fine. So all I did was like shrink those columns I no longer like needed or really didn't need to look at any of those. Um, there you go, now we're back on. It's all good, <laughs> not broken, that's a good question you're asked. Sorry, for me to ask a question and break your room. No, it's fine. It happens, which I had to do uh, that whenever I changed the um, Alcatraz um, Indians welcome picture as well. So I had to take it offline for a few minutes to do that. So yeah. it happens. Um, we have, I think we did the last few questions. We have a couple of quick questions about the images. People really like that images, which I think is it makes sense. A lot of we know that catches people's attentions more than just mm -hmm. attention more than just block words. Um, but what about using GIFs, animated things in Google Forms? Can you do? Will it take yes, that instead yeah. of still photos? Um, I, I have not done it myself, but, um, I saw one online and I think it was Rhode Island. They do the rooster games. Yes. She mm -hmm. had emailed me and was like, Hey, this is what I made um, based off what you did. And it was off of like their state's children book awards. So unfortunately it was a lot of bit books I hadn't read yet. So I'm here guessing like what the answer is. Cause it was a little bit more comprehension based, but someone also, else did have an answer yeah they said you can you just have to download it and upload it and she's used canva to upload those kind of animated gifts so yes it can be done you got to mm -hmm. download it from wherever you're finding it then upload it into wherever you're using it yep 
Yeah, within Google image searches within the forms, it will not search for gifts. So that is something that you would have to find elsewhere. So you'd have to do with that, the, the um, attendee said, download it and then upload it from your own computer rather than just the internal search that you're using. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and now you mentioned about that you, you you know when our brothers contact you about not using images from the movies. What about illustrations in the books? Have you even tried? Have you tried doing those, or did you just then say I'm just going to go out and find publicly accessible things? I I have not attempted to do illustrations from the books um, because that's you know, J.K. Rowling copyright versus Warner Brothers, that would be different. Um, I know that she has released all of her stuff for fair use for educators and things like that um, for the time being during our current health crisis. Um, and especially after the thing from Warner Brothers came down, I was hesitant to do anything like that because it was the free use is for a, a window of time um, and wanting it to have a little bit more longevity. Now, as you saw from my escape room, nothing is too dependent on the books and um, the, oh, where's Green Gods? Um, even like this is just a random Google image search of gold kind of right. thing for the green gods. And then um, the pictures, that was a free image search as well as the um, train from above. So there are Harry Potter related things out there. Um, I know within Unsplash, oh, there we go. I love Unsplash. Everybody should use Unsplash. Um, There's a lot of other things that we have used um, in the past for other promotional and other things. So these are, again, fair use things, um, you know, from people visiting the parks and taking pictures or. Yep. Um, and then they put them up there. And that's what they, yeah, this tells you what they will allow them to be used for and everything. And mm -hmm. yeah. if you were to download this one, it says, OK. It's appreciated. Um, here's how you can embed it. And that's where, like, on my first page, I say, hey, it's by this person on Unsplash kind of thing. So that way I can give credit to that person um, for taking that picture. Yeah. So I, I have not tried to use any images from the books. Um, and I personally would be hesitant to because I know a lot of times um, with copyright, there, there's a window that it's okay for, and if you want right something, now, yeah. And then, I mean, a lot of the publishers, like you said, J.K. Rowling, are doing this to, and even Warner Brothers told you, sure, you can use them for now, but once this crisis mm -hmm. is over, you're going to change it. If you want to handle, have to do that later, fine, use them. But if you'd rather just say, I just want it to be able to be used, you know, long, long after this, let's just do it right now from these freely accessed, available ones that you don't have to worry about. Now I got to go back and change everything. Yeah, and, and that's why after a week, um, after I got told that information, I was like, I'm just going to go ahead and change it and be done with it because I, I didn't want that hanging over my head. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I went ahead and made the call to take out the video, put something else in. And, you know, we got some Dewey Decimal System in there. So that's fun for all the kids. In the little libraries. <laughs> all right, one last <laughs> question. I'm going to ask here, which I think is interesting. So for the um, the, the translation, and I actually haven't looked through the entire thing. Do you actually mention the name of the books, like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone? Is that actually? Nope. Okay, um, so the question asked is you change it to, you know, Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone, you know, the different countries have the different versions of the title of the book, but since that wording wasn't actually used. Yeah, I think the only thing that really changed, nothing. Because, um, what, okay, one thing, um, in the text conversation, there are some books that I made up, like Sizzling Scales, Dragon Poetry um, is one, and then Magical Maps um, from Around the World, I think, was the other book I made up that mm -hmm. they have to go through and see, like, where they would fall in the Dewey Decimal System and add those numbers together. So they, I told the people who were translating, like, Sizzling scales is a play on words and the alliteration in English. So whatever, you know, you want to change it to for it to make sense, that sounds good. But uh, no, none of the... Um, and while you're on that, yes. you use the, you're on that text one there, is, that's interesting. You've got that um, fake text going back here. Someone was wondering about this. Did you just like have a fake conversation with someone or is this something where you can go and create these kind of things? 
I think text message <laughs> um, on the. Oh, look at that. Yeah. So um, you can change. There's an app for everything. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's like WYSI oh, Wi Fi. I even made. Purposes, though. <laughs> yeah, I made the time 11 a.m. and then 1100 is one of the options. So I tried to like incorporate numbers within the text to kind of help throw people off and make mm -hmm. them think that that might be a clue. But on the. Too many tabs open. Um, <laughs> on the first page of it, it says the fake text was made on ifaketextmessages. Ah, okay. So it had a link to that. Okay, I didn't even say that. Awesome. She says that is so cool. Okay, I think a lot of people are going to be creating using fake texting now, only for good reasons and purposes. Though, yes. don't try. use your powers for good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. I think we will wrap things up then right now. Um, all of the major questions have been answered or discussed, so that's awesome. Um, there's lots of thank you so much. Someone says, I can't wait to play. Um, hoping okay. to do something like this for our press, our patrons. Thank you for opening this up nationwide. Um, so, um, yeah, this is great. It was fun to make, and I'm really happy everyone's enjoying it and oh, finding other ways to use it, too. Yeah, and I think yeah, if your other topics that you know you were you obviously said everyone loves Harry Potter, it's a thing you know. Go and anything else that you have an interest in, or any of your patrons have an interest in, you can do the same exact thing. And just you know, you, once you know, I think it's easy and fun when you know the topic that yeah. you're trying to work in, and, or the world you're trying to work in, and um, the things just start coming out of ideas of what would fit into, mm -hmm. into that. Yeah. And that's something where if you don't feel comfortable creating whatever story on your own, you, you're not an island. You can reach out to other, you know, colleagues or friends. I spent ball with my younger sister, especially like when I was working on my murder mystery. I'm like, okay, how can I make things juicier? Like, how can I make this person and this person not like each other? Yeah. And, you know, just talking with him ever to help, like, get those creative juices flowing and get ideas from other people, so... And it's the kind of thing a lot of libraries are doing when you are creating any sort of new program or what you're going to do. Same process, same thinking, just it's coming out um, digitally, yeah. All right, so thank you, awesome. I plan to include this for summer reading. Awesome, Jeannie, one of our libraries here in Nebraska. Um, Oh, I'm impressed with your staff service to your library community and to us as a larger library community. Absolutely. This is great. This is what we all do. I mean, uh, this is something that I, I, I've heard from various places. We do a lot of R&D in library mm -hmm. world, uh, rip off and duplicate. <laughs> and that's the same concept. Go ahead and do that. It is totally um, out there for you. And we want you to R&D it. Yes. <laughs> Please rip off and duplicate. Um, just if you do rip off and duplicate, take my email address out of it. I got an email uh, from someone like about, hey, I have a question about your escape room. I'm like, I didn't make that. I have no idea what to do. <laughs> That's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> no. So I had to find this library wherever and be like, hey, just so you know. If somebody has a question, yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's been great. Um, People from around the world, y'all have helping me help me get uh, so many reference questions and for our statistics as well <laughs> this last month. So thank you. Side effect, yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I think we will wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sydney. I'm so glad we were able to work this out and get you on um, with us here today. Mm -hmm. oh. Happy to help. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'm going to uh, pull back presenter control to me and bring up my screen um, just to wrap things up. There we are. Um, yeah, this is the page for today's show where you guys are all attending. Um, we will be posting the archive, and I'll tell, I'll show you here how to get to our archives anywhere. Um, so far, Encompass Live. If you just use your search engine of choice, Google, whatever. Encompass Live is the only thing called that on the internet so far. Nobody can see <laughs> it. <laughs> so it'll come up with our page. Um, and these are our upcoming shows. And right underneath there is a link to our archives. Um, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate, uh, the recording should be available um, by the end of the week at the latest. Uh, I will announce to everyone. I'll put it on our, on our various uh, social media and websites. But um, everyone who attended today and everyone who pre-registered will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. It'll be here at the top of the list. The most recent one goes top here. This is the one from last week. Um, they had a bunch of different resources. But there'll be a link to the recording and a link to the slides that Sydney's going to send me 
So you will have um, access to that on here. And while we're here, I'll show you on our, I'll mention on our archives, you'll notice you can, there's a search feature here, so you can search our full archives, or you can search just the most recent 12 months. That is because Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, and so we are going on our 11th, whatever year, 10 years worth of archives are here on our page. If I scroll all the way to the bottom, you'd see lots and lots of older ones. So just do pay attention as you are looking and um, watching anything from archives of the original broadcast date. Uh, some information may have changed since the original broadcast. Uh, websites might, links might not work anymore. Some services may have changed completely. Some things might not exist anymore. Uh, some things carry on for, you know, will always be useful, like good books to read for teens or something. You know, we can always use those, but some things will have, you know, a, a shelf life. But we are a library here. We do keep things for um, archival purposes. So um, as long as all these links work, we will still have them up there on the, on the page there. So just um, pay attention to what date something was broadcast as you are watching it um, on here. Or just do your search only for the most recent 12 months and you know you'll have current information. Um, we do have a Facebook page, page for Encompass Live here where we post reminders, things, updates about the show. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there and you'll see our reminders about uh, shows coming up when recordings are ready. Um, any other things that are here, give us a like over on Facebook. Back to our main page here. Uh, Yes. All right. So, and this is our upcoming schedule. You see, I have some dates filled in for May and for June and some open dates still. I'm discussing with people about um, adding in their um, sessions. So as we get more things confirmed, they'll appear on here. Uh, Encompass Live, we will, we are determined to keep going with the show through everything that's going on with the pandemic we're experiencing right now. As you can see here, what's great about an online show is we can do it from anywhere. Um, right now I'm in my office, Sydney's in her library, but I have also done this, I think last week's show, from home just because that's where I happen to be. And our presenters can be anywhere from home. So uh, we will keep going with the show uh, as we, um, as long as I can get people to come on and talk, which I usually have no, no problem with that. So look for all these dates to get filled in as time goes on. And I'll help you join us for next week's show, which is done, booked. Uh, pretty Sweet Tech, HTML5 and CSS3, Basic Building Blocks of the Web. Uh, Amanda Sweet is our Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and she does a monthly um, um, Encompass Live show. Usually every, the last Wednesday of the month will be a Pretty Sweet Tech. So if you're interested in um, anything techie related, um, definitely those will be the ones for you. She also does blog posts regularly on our blog that are under her same uh, little uh, logo there, pretty sweet tech. And next we should talk about website design, um, HTML and CSS. So definitely uh, sign up and join us for that one. And any of the other ones we have here on the list and keep an eye on our schedule for uh, as other shows get added. So um, thank you so very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Sydney, for being here with us. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, this was great. I think we're going to have a lot of new virtual rooms um, being virtual escape rooms being created and a lot more people playing in the ones that are out there. I know I'm going to go through some of them when I have some free time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And we'll see you another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.